seated. Good morning and welcome to Ridley Park Presbyterian Church on this beautiful sunny day. Now I'm taking a quick look. I'm looking for some sleepy eyes of those of you that stayed up to watch the Phillies get on to the second round tomorrow. All right. Uh, you didn't have to stay up too late for that. But Come on, it's the Phillies. We don't need to clap for the Phillies. But anyway. <laughs> now Washington, we need to clap for Washington. That's I apologize, there are plenty of announcements. Please stick with me this morning. We've got a long list of announcements. Um, Pastor Thomas is on vacation, as was announced, but if you have any pastoral needs, just please call the church office and those will be taken care of. If you would be interested in a new members class and to learn more about our church and may want to become a new member, join our new members classes. They will be held on Sundays between worship services, that's in between 10 and 11, on November 6th. 13, 20, and 27. Please email info at rppcusa.org to let us know if you're interested. There are two Circle of Care cards in the back. Uh, Norm Huxley recently fell and broke a couple ribs. 
And so he is recovering, and we want to send him a care card and tell him we're praying for him. And Pat Welsh has been under the weather for a while now, and uh, we would also like to send a uh, prayer card or uh, the circle of care card to him as well. They are in the back. Please sign those, and we will pass those on to them. The trip to Sight and Sound. There are still two t tickets left, but this is the last week for you to get those tickets. Um, at the production of David on October 15th. If you're interested, see Tracy Kearney. Hey, Tracy, raise your hand. There she is back there. Everyone riding the bus should be at the church by 12 p.m. The, the bus will depart at 12.15. The bus will be unable to wait for latecomers. So if you're one that's maybe sometimes a couple minutes late, you might be trying to jump into the luggage compartment as it's pulling away from the curb, okay? So uh, please be here by 12.15. Anything else, Tracy? Does that pretty well cover it? All right, very good. Um, we've been announcing the Christmas choir. Please join our Christmas choir. Put a smile on my wife's face, would you please? And join that Christmas choir as they will be singing a number of times through the Advent and Christmas season. Uh, men's Bible study has started again Thursday night at 7 p.m. in the church parlor. CEF Club for our kids just started this week. Uh, that's on Tuesday, or Tuesday afternoons from 4.30 to 5.45. We could use more kids. If you know of anyone that would like to attend the Good News Club, uh, they can register at rppcusa.org or just come out on Tuesday at uh, 4.30. We'll be glad to have them. Um, grief Share, this ministry is for those who are processing loss. It meets Fridays from 6.30 to 8.30 in the church parlor. You can, do I need to give the address again? Go to the, go to the RPPC, well it does, it's at slash grief share to uh, register for that on the bulletin board. Uh, October collection, we are collecting Christmas tree lights and ornaments for our Christmas tree Santa program. Lights purchased must be a warm, warm light. With green wire, ornaments must be purchased from our Amazon wish list found in your church email or by scanning the QR code on the screen. You can bring them to church or select Nick Furman's address when placing your order. Uh, book club, mark your calendars for the next book club meeting. Book club will be at 6.30 on November 7th. And the book for the next meeting will be, will be These High Green Hills. Almost last, but what, two more. Christmas Bazaar. Our Christmas Bazaar is back. It will take place on Saturday, November 12th from 9 to 2. Lunch will be from 11 to 1. And Santa will be there from 10 to 1. Please begin saving any items you'd like to donate that you'd like to get rid of from your household and bring them to the attic treasures for our jewelry tables. Collection dates will be announced soon. And I was told just before the service there's still a need for people to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for tomorrow. Please see Karen Montoro if you can help out with those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Wow, that was a lot of announcements. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you. We just thank you and adore you that you give us this opportunity that we have to join together as a church family, to corporately, to come together and worship you. Father, we are aware that nothing of any spiritual benefit will take place this morning unless your Holy Spirit is loose to work among us and our hearts and our minds are willing to allow the Holy Spirit to complete the work that he desires. Lord, we eagerly anticipate what you have in store for us this morning, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing And you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way
guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh. he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up gathering us all here today. Dear Lord, we stray from your grace every day, and we fall short of your glory. And every day, we feel the temptation to want to pursue our own visions, to pursue what we want, what our selfish hearts desire. Dear Lord, renew our hearts and help us to pursue your vision. Amen. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies, only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, 
Children, come on up. you're all here this morning. This is super fun and we all get to learn about God together and everybody out sitting out there gets to learn about God too. You know, one of my favorite, favorite things about God is that he says he's always, always with us. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to remember that though because I can't see him. I can't see him anywhere. But he sends us reminders that he's there in everything, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay, I need four volunteers. Connor, you be the sun, and I want you to turn around and hold it up nice, nice and high so that everybody back there can see it, okay? What's that? Cloud? Yes. Good job. Uh, thank you. That was my <laughs> artwork. Another volunteer, please. Okay, so clouds, I want you to come over here and I want you to cover up the sun. <laughs> Whoa, you did a good job. <laughs> okay, is the sun still there? Yes, it is still there. Just because we can't see it right now doesn't mean it's not there. It, we can still see that it's a sunny day, even if the clouds are covering it up. And that's just like God, keep holding it there, just because I like to torture people. This is fun <laughs> to watch you try to hold your hands up. We know that even though we can't see God, he's always there, like the sun is always there on a cloudy day. And we know that he can be with, he's with us when we're lonely or sad or when it's dark or when we're in our room at night in our bed and we might feel afraid. He's always there. Thank you, clouds and sun. You can put them on there. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you are always with us. You never, ever leave us. You care about us and you love us. Help us to remember that. I pray for these kids in Sunday school and for their teachers that they will learn a lot more about you and that they'll learn to trust you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great time in Sunday school. All right, let's join together in the unison prayer of confession. Here we go. All right, let's pray together. Eternal and gracious God, we praise you for you are just and true. Your love is with us always. In your grace, you call us to confess our sin and receive your mercy. We confess that we have done what we should not have done. We know this is true, so we acknowledge it before you. We confess that we have not done what we should have done. We know this is true as well, so we admit it in your presence. Help us to learn to trust you, Will, that we have been framed from what you tell us not to do and do what you call us to do, so that we serve you joyfully and you receive honor through us. We pray through Christ. Let's take a moment and silently and privately talk with the Lord. Amen. In John 20, 31, the Apostle John recorded the reason that he penned that gospel, the book of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may be forgiven and have life in his name. There is forgiveness of sin for those that believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. 
Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word this morning, your desire is that your word will always come to life in our hearts. You are the only one that knows what you want to accomplish this morning. We pray that you will use your word to change our lives this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me one second, please. Um, my mother-in-law is here with me today. And she's up here in the front pew, and I didn't know she was coming. I got to go into my sermon and find out where that mother-in-law joke is, and I got to remove that. From <laughs> <laughs> I'm her favorite son-in-law, and she's my favorite. Because I'm her only son-in-law. Right? <laughs> Three weeks ago, Jim mentioned that we have a new clock back there at the soundboard. And then he said these words, okay, message received. You know, sometimes pastors need to have a message to say, okay, it's time. Okay, it's over. It's time to bring it to a close. But that reminds me of a story I heard a long time ago. And there's a little boy in, in the church with his father. And the boy was at the inquisitive stage of his life. And he wanted to know what certain things, you know, certain things that happen in the church, what does it mean? 
And they were in church, and all of a sudden the chapel bells started to ring. And he said, Dad, why are the chapel bells ringing? He said, well, son, it's almost time for church to start, and the chapel bells play right before church. And he said, oh, okay, that's good. And the service got started. They got into a song. And while they were singing a song, the pastor raised his hands. The little boy tugged at his Dad, why is the pastor raising his hands? Well, son, it's a style of worship. It's a way of worshiping God. And he's worshiping God while he sings that song. Oh, oh, okay. And the service goes on. And the pastor gets up behind the pulpit. And the pastor takes his place. He takes his watch off. And he puts it on the podium. And he says, Dad, Dad, why did the pastor put his watch on the podium? He said, son, believe me, that meant nothing. <laughs> Every once in a while I have a sermon which is a little too long and Karen always says, Dave, please, leave them wanting more, not wanting less. <laughs> you agree with her. Okay, that, that's, that is good advice. That is good advice. Today I would call this sermon a reminder sermon for most of us. A reminder of one of the great promises, one of the great truths in God's word that he has for us. I believe that most of us have heard and believe and it's up here. But sometimes life makes it difficult to live it out. And we struggle with that. I don't know about you, but I really appreciate God's reminders from time to time. God, thank you. I needed that. Some of you, this might be new to you, and I hope it is very encouraging and enlightening for you. And I probably could stop now, because what I'm going to talk about is what Karen used in her children's message this morning, and she probably did it in a much more interesting fashion. But I can remember, I can't remember how many times I've heard in a discussion, boy, I just don't sense God's presence. I don't sense God working in my life like he has in the past. Have you felt that way? I do from time to time. You know, sometimes there's a strong presence of God in our lives. God is really working and moving in our lives, and at other times, not so. And we wonder what happened. Can you recall a time when you've talked to someone going through a very difficult time, maybe even a life-threatening life illness, and that person says, thank you. Thank you for praying for me. I could sense your prayers working in my life, and I could sense God's presence working in my life as well. Boy, those words are encouraging when people go through difficult times, that they sense the presence of God. If I were to ask you who were the greatest men and women of the Old Testament, it would probably be a varied list, but it could be a very long list. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Deborah, um, Elijah, Elisha, Esther, David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The list goes on and on of the great men and women of the Old Testament that did mighty and great things for God. Now as we read those stories, I think sometimes we come to a false conclusion. We come to the conclusion that these aren't normal people. They've got special gifts. God has done something. Maybe there's a, a position somewhere in between God and man, and that's where they are, but they've got these special gifts that they accomplish things that we can't accomplish. We're just normal people. We can't do that. And not only that, but I'll bet they always felt very, very close to God. Boy, they felt the presence of God all the time as they were empowered by God for God to use them. That's not true. None of that. Each one, any great man or woman of the scriptures or of life around us is just a normal person. A normal person that has been chosen by God, that has been filled with the Spirit, and a person who then is not afraid to go out on a limb and do something that God is telling them to do. 
Even though I might be afraid, even though I might not feel qualified, God has asked me to do that. And it's through God's power and strength that I can do that. And they do. And the truth is, these great men and women, they struggled in their relationship with God as well. They have the same struggles that we do. A couple characters I'd like to bring to your attention this morning are, first one would be Elijah. In 1 Kings 18 and 19, we find the story of Elijah taking on the prophets of Baal. Queen Jezebel worshipped Baal. And Baal was highly revered in Israel at the time. And God told um, Elijah to go face down Ahab and to bring the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. And they met at Mount Carmel. Elijah had built an altar. He had put animals to sacrifice on that altar. He built a trough around that altar, and he challenged the prophets of Baal, pray to your God. Ask him to come down with fire and burn up these sacrifices. So for hours, the prophets of Baal cried out to Baal, Baal, please come down and burn up these sacrifices. But they were unsuccessful. Hours and hours. At times, Elijah Oh, maybe you're not crying loud enough. Oh, cut yourselves and cry louder. Maybe your God will hear you. But nothing. Next, Elijah moves up. He gets pails of water. And he dumps enough water on the sacrifice that it's overflowing the trough. There is so much water that this really should not burn. And then it says, the fire of the Lord fell. And burned up the sacrifices. And at that time, Elijah ordered that they kill all the prophets of Baal for being disobedient to the God of the universe. Wow. To be there. The faith in that great work that Elijah accomplished. The second character is David. David. The youngest of Jesse's sons. And the story opens up, he's a shepherd. He's out tending the sheep for his father. His first big conquest is when he goes and he slays the giant, Goliath, who was taunting Israel. And Israel is hiding because of this giant taunting the Israelite army. And David comes along and says, what's the matter? Why won't anybody go out and defeat Goliath? And they thought David was nuts for wanting to do that. But David does, and he goes on to be the greatest warrior in David's army. David killed so many of the enemy, while the people were singing, Saul slain his thousands. They're now singing, David slain his tens of thousands. David, a man after God's own heart. A great and mighty man of the Old Testament. Elijah and David were mighty men of God, but they also experienced the weaker side of humanity. Too. They were humans like everyone else. I've always been intrigued by the next part of the story in Elijah's story. In King, 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab had fled back to the palace. He told Queen Jezebel what had taken place. And Jezebel offered up this threat. She said, in the next 24 hours, Elijah will die. Elijah heard about that threat. And Elijah ran as fast and as far away as he could. And when he got to a place where he felt he was safe, he cried out, I've had enough. Take my life. What happened to Elijah? What happened to this great, faithful man? David, defeating Goliath, becoming the king of Israel. And we know the book of Psalms are written, many of the Psalms are written by David. But David wrote two types of Psalms. 
He wrote praise psalms in which his, just, his heart cried out in love and appreciation and adoration for God for who he is. But he also penned many lament psalms where David was in a very difficult situation and he cried out for help. He cried out for God to even save his life. And he cried out and said, God, where did you go? Where did you go? Psalm 10, verse 1 says, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13, 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? Both David and Elijah, they struggle with sensing the presence and the power of God at certain times in their lives. Can anybody relate to that? I do. At times, we just wonder, man, where did God go? Um, more than likely, you feel the same way too at times. Last week, I was out in the hallway. You know, I don't know if you know where the book rack is across from the office. And I saw this book. The title of it is, Where is God When I'm Afraid? Why would somebody pen that book? You know why? Now, there's probably many reasons it could be. But either the, either the author had experienced those kind of feelings, and he was expressing what he had found out through that where he had heard other people who have gone through it, and he was addressing those feelings. Fear, life, sometimes we just wonder where God went. What happens when God feels far away? We wonder where he went. Now, I can't answer that question for every person in every situation, but I know there's two principles in Scripture that do address this idea of God's relationship with us. The first one is sin. In the book of Genesis right, Genesis, right at the beginning in the creation, God created Adam and Eve, and it tells us Adam and Eve and God walked in perfect harmony. God would come down to the Garden of Eden and walk and talk with Adam and Eve. There was no separation. There was perfect unity and communion between Adam and Eve and God until Adam and Eve sinned. And then the next time God came into the garden, Adam and Eve felt the need to hide from God. God called out, Adam and Eve, where are you? We're hiding. Sin. Sin separated and hindered the relationship between God and Adam and Eve. And, as we know, that sin has been imputed to us. And it separates us from God as well. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and... Turn from their wicked ways. Repent and turn from your sin. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not listen. Proverbs 28, 9. If anyone turns a deaf ear to the law of the Lord... Even his prayers are detestable. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your, iniquity, your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Do I wonder? Do we wonder at times why we aren't hearing from God? 
why we don't sense the presence of God in our lives. The first thing each of us should do is to ask God, God, is there a sin that I've committed? Is there a sin in my life that I need to confess before you to repent and to ask forgiveness so I can restore that relationship? Now we're going to get similar to the children's story. We're going to ask for some slides to come up. There we go. That's a beautiful sunny day. You know, a couple of days ago, we were wondering if we were going to see that again when the remnants of the hurricane come in. But there's a beautiful, full sunny day there. And then to the next one. Okay, we can see the sun. There's a little bit of the sun, but the clouds are rolling in. And then the third one. Okay. You can see just, you can't see the sun, you can see a little bit of the sun. When I was in Bible college, my very first year Bible college, I had a class, and I had a professor that illustrated it this way. I'm not an artist, but that you might enjoy more than anything else. All right, there's the sun. Beautiful sun. We see the rays coming off the sun. There we go, we've got a couple people on the planet here. Yes, sir, I, I was going to be an art student, but I changed my mind after a while. <laughs> the sun represents God. And of course, the stick figures represent mankind. In the beginning, there was sweet, unhindered communion between man and God. But then... Some clouds rolled in. These clouds were sin. It's very easy to see what happens. There is no longer this clear path between me and my Heavenly Father. These clouds have come in to my life, and now my relationship with God is hindered. And as those verses we read, God is not able to listen, to hear, when there's sin clouding the relationship. But when I think about that, that's when I am thankful for a verse like 1 John 1, 9, where it says, and God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins and declare us righteous if we confess our sins unto him. And it clears that relationship back up so that we have that pure relationship, that unhindered relationship with God. I don't want to say how many years ago I saw that illustration, but it made a big impact on my life at that time, which helps remind me of the importance of a pure life before Jesus. The first thing that separates us from God in that relationship is sin. The second thing is a lack of faith, oftentimes due to life's trials. We all know that trials are just a part of life. We all face them. No one is exempt. The good, the righteous, the unrighteous, the sinful. Pain and agony is a part of life. Matthew 5, 45 says, He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We, we all receive both, and we know that. But for a Christian, there is a reason for the difficulties in life. There is a purpose that God has for those. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance so that you may be mature and complete. As we all grew up, we understood what makes the body stronger and healthier. It's taking care of the body. It's working the body, whether it's lifting weights or exercise, whatever, exercising the body made it stronger. For God, the exercise to mature us into strong believers 
is trials. Do you know why? Because that's a test of my faith. It was easy to have faith in God when life was really, really good, when all those good things are happening. But when the bad things happen, God, God why? What happened? What I do? What's going on? Our faith goes out the window. And we wonder what God is doing in our lives right now. God is really trying to achieve something positive, helping us to grow and understand that even in a difficult situation, God is there. The men's Bible study in Mark, we just studied the story where Jesus and the disciples were in a boat. And that big storm came on the waters. Jesus was asleep in the boat. God was with the disciples right there in the boat. And the disciples are fearful. They're crying out. And they wake Jesus up. Jesus, don't you care? We're going to die. And Jesus woke up and said, what? (laughs) Oh, disciples, where is your faith? Where is your faith? God was right there in the boat with them. And life's trials and struggles just knocked that faith right out of the water. And they thought they were going to die. Our faith is what keeps us strong. And when we have a lack of faith, that interferes with that relationship with God as well. Just like you and me, Elijah and David, they're just human beings, just like us. And in their serious trials, they cried out, God, where are you? And we do the same sometimes. Whenever I question the presence of God in my life, I need to trust in him and in the truths of his word. That he is there. He has not gone anywhere. He is there beside me. One of my favorite stories about the presence of God is found in Genesis 28. Uh, It's about Jacob. Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob is fleeing from his brother Esau because Jacob had deceived Esau twice. And Esau wanted to kill Jacob because of that. And Rebekah, his mother, found out, and she took, grabbed Jason, Jacob and said, listen, I want you to flee. I want you to get away. Your brother wants to kill you. I want you to go to Haran. That's where her family was from. I want you to go back to my people and find yourself a wife, but get out of here so Esau does not kill you. So Jacob does. He begins the trek to, to Haran. And at that point in time, they're traveling on foot. He couldn't hop on a bus or a plane or a car. He was traveling by foot. And one night it came time for him to sleep. He laid his head down on a rock. I can't understand that. I don't think I could even sleep on a rock. But anyway, he laid his head down on a rock. And then during the night, he had a dream. This stairway came down. It went from the earth to heaven. And there were angels going up and down the stairway. And God was at the top of the stairway. And God spoke to Jacob that night in the dream. And, God's, and Jacob, when he woke up the next morning in Genesis 28, verse 16, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was unaware. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was unaware. That pretty well summarizes exactly what we're talking about this morning. We are in God's presence. The closeness closeness of God is a two-way street. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So we have a role in that. God is not going to draw near to us unless we draw near to him first. But by, to draw near to God, there's a couple of things we have to do that we've talked about this morning. First, ask forgiveness. 
of the sins in my life and purify that relationship between God and myself. The second thing is we need to trust God and the truth of the Holy Scriptures that God is with us. Psalm 119, verse 151. David was, again, in a bad situation, and he cried out, Yet you are near, O Lord. Lamentations 3, 57. You came near when I called you. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Not only is God always near, we can't go anywhere where God won't be. God is everywhere. We can go nowhere where we would be without the presence of God. In closing, I would like to invite the worship team up. We've got a song for you this morning that really addresses what we've been talking about this morning and the closeness that we sense to God. And I'd just like to make, give you this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon once said, Faith is a principle which hath its roots deeper than feelings. We believe whether we see or not. We believe whether we feel or not. God is here. God is present with me everywhere. Do we believe that?
chorus, but I love that song. That's a song that draws me closer to him just by singing that one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a wonderful and a loving Heavenly Father. While we see and hear about your goodness all around us, we also see the pain and the evil that sin has brought into the world and into our lives. Lord, we pray for those that have had much of their lives destroyed by the hurricane which struck Florida and some of the other southern states. We pray for the families that have lost loved ones due to the hurricane. Father, please comfort their hearts. Our hearts go out to those who have lost everything and now face the task of beginning all over again. Lord, bring comfort to them that they are suffering and are in need. Father, please be their provider. And Father, guide us to help us understand what we can do to serve those that are in need at this time. Lord, we continue to pray for the ongoing war in Ukraine. I don't doubt that you have already intervened in ways we are unaware of, but Lord, we pray for the Ukrainian people and ask that you bring this war to an end. We pray that the donations that were delivered this week to be shipped to Ukraine, that you will help them arrive safely and quickly in Ukraine, and they will provide needed relief to the Ukrainians. We also have many concerns and needs within our own congregation. Some have lost loved ones. Some are experiencing sickness or financial needs, emotional needs, a number of other needs in their lives, Lord. Father, they might be in one of those situations where they're saying, God, where are you? Please help. Father, there are people struggling. And at this time, we ask that you would provide for whatever need they may have. Father, we also pray for those that are struggling spiritually, those that are walking away from you at this time, those that believe they don't need you, those that are wondering where you've gone. They haven't sensed your presence in some time. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be at work in their lives and that they would come nearer to God so that God will come nearer to them. Father, draw them back to yourself. Lord, we pray for Pastor Jim and Devin while they're away. Lord, please use this time to give them rest, to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to draw them closer to you which will empower them when they return. Father, you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. And we thank you that we have been able to worship and praise you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nehemiah wrote, Father, blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are Lord. Lord, as we leave this place, we take your glorious name with us. May we continually dwell on your glorious name and help us to share that glorious name with others around us. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. 